Hi everyone, uh, today what we're going to do is wrap up the book uh, by looking at the final two chapters in uh, the Kitchens uh, book. So here we're looking at Gary Allen Fine's uh, study of what we can call the social psychology of social organization. So again, we're looking at kind of the connection between different social structures within a social organization and how people navigate those social structures to be successful, to sustain a successful business overall. So specifically, we're looking at order and restaurants, how it's created, how it's maintained. But again, we could apply this uh, understanding to other organizations, uh, other places of work as well. So last time we talked about the different types of uh, order that need to come together to create overall social order in the uh, restaurant. And so again, we can apply these different forms of order to other fields as well. But overall, we talked about the physical order needs to be in place, uh, issues with physical space and equipment. We talked about social order. Everybody needs to know their role and perform the responsibilities attached to the role. And then we talked about symbolic order. You need to have the social recognition and the respect uh, among coworkers. So overall, kind of each order needs to be functional for function to occur overall. And each order has its own potential difficulties. And you have to navigate those potential difficulties to establish the order on the kind of the one, two, and three, and to establish the order overall uh, with a capital O. And so we said people are more likely to establish those orders in an overall order within the restaurant or whatever social organization you're looking at when you have a work culture, a work culture that brings people together, uh, makes everybody on the same page, and you have each other's back. And with this uh, work culture, you can be more li likely to navigate any issues that do emerge, whether it be issues in a physical sense, in the social sense, or the symbolic sense. And you create such a work order uh, through play, you know, through kind of the messing around, uh, the leisure that goes on kind of inside and outside the work. So again, this work culture is important, but it doesn't emerge out of thin air. That doesn't simply happen. You have to create the work culture and you create it through the play that goes on kind of within the workspace. So now today what we're going to do is focus on some different social structures that come into play uh, within the restaurants, within social organizations uh, that need to be navigated uh, to be successful overall. And specifically, the social structures we're looking at here are twofold. Uh, we're looking at limitations in economic sense and limitations that are there kind of in an aesthetic sense. And so when we talk about economic limitations, we're talking about issues of money in the finance. And then we talk about external uh, economic limitations. Uh, economic limitations are kind of outside the restaurant, then internal forces as well economic limitations within the restaurant itself, within the organization. Aesthetic limitations are more about different standards of taste, uh, whether it be standards of customers, uh, standards of uh, the workers. And then we talk about the status of the overall restaurant and how we have to navigate these uh, status issues. You have to navigate these uh, standard issues to be successful. And so this ties into kind of the last few parts of your second book report. So today we're gonna break each down in the next couple of slides. So again, you know, the key idea is, you know, you need to face and navigate these certain limitations if you want to sustain a business, you wanna be successful overall. And so the economic limitations are both external and internal. And the external forces are kind of market forces. Um, you can think about kind of what's going on now with uh, COVID-19 and how these kind of larger forces outside of the business are really causing these organizations to kind of rethink, you know, what they're doing and how they're doing it if they want to be sustainable, you know, throughout uh, the pandemic. And so that's where we're looking at kind of these external forces. Uh, one of the markets, you know, when the market is doing well, typically restaurants do well. Uh, when the market is not doing well, typically restaurants uh, don't do as well. And so you have to kind of navigate uh, these uh, forces by, you know, kind of 
making sure that you're being smart with your resources. And so rather than kind of focusing on creating a lot of profits and making a lot of money, often what restaurants try to do, especially at the beginning of the restaurant, is to focus on cutting their losses. So you got to make sure that you're kind of, you know, cutting corners, uh, doing more with less. And so you're going to cut any losses and kind of sustain yourself that way rather than focusing on uh, making big profits. Another external force is the customer. And here we're looking at basically getting a customer base. So if nobody's coming in to your restaurants, if nobody's spending money, and then you're not going to be successful. You're not going to be sustainable. And so here, basically, you want to establish trust and loyalty uh, with customers. And the book talks about different strategies you can use to establish this trust and loyalty. Um, you know, you get to know people, uh, you call them by their first name, uh, you start to build kind of a regular base. And when people start to kind of trust you and feel like they're kind of part of the uh, family, you start to get that loyalty. And with that loyalty, you start to get customers coming in uh, weekly, bi-weekly, sometimes daily uh, basis. Uh, customers will tell other people about the restaurants and recommend you. So basically, you know, you want to do your best in terms of serving quality food, but also kind of making people feel uh, like they're at home, making people feel that they're special when they're in your restaurant. And uh, another external force today is the media. And basically, you know, the strategy is you want to avoid getting bad press and you want to try to receive uh, good press. And so again, this is important as we talked about before. Uh, today, the media has a much larger reach uh, compared to the past. So press, it can work for you if it's good press, but it can work against you if it's bad press. So you want to kind of navigate this issue uh, by basically always putting your best foot forward and whenever you are interacting with the media, you know, always try to come across and leave a good impression in the mind of others. And so with bad press, you know, you have to kind of watch how you uh, deal with that as well. You know, there's certain you know, things to do and not to do when you receive bad press. Uh, should you confront it? Should you just ignore it? You know, how should you confront it? And so it's kind of a tricky issue and there's not a perfect science to it, but when you do receive bad press, you want to do your best to kind of maybe learn from the experience and let customers know that you're listening to them and you're making the proper uh, changes, you're listening to the recommendations. And so again, these kind of external forces that connect to uh, the economy and that connect, to, that connect to money issues, you want to navigate them by kind of dealing with them and when you have to encounter them. And so internal forces, you're looking at kind of pricing issues, issues of debt, uh, labor costs, food cost. And, you know, overall, when it comes to pricing your food, you want to, again, in the mind of the customer to have fair pricing. You know, you don't want customers to think that you're, they're spending more than they should be. Uh, they're spending more for what they're actually getting. So, again, you want to kind of establish in the customer's mind that they're getting their money's worth. It's a fair pricing. And once they kind of see that, then they recognize that I may be spending, you know, A, but I'm really getting my money's worth compared to if they believe the pricing is unfair, then they're going to say I spent A, but I didn't get uh, what I should be getting with that money. And so again, here could be the bad press emerging, uh, overpriced food for the quantity and the quality. Uh, here, you know, customers are not going to be coming back. You're not going to get that loyalty. Uh, that you would get uh, people thought that the food was uh, priced fairly and the food was good in terms of the quantity you received, but also the quality as well. Um, debt is an issue, and especially again when you're kind of starting out and you're getting a space in which you're going to have your restaurant. And basically, you want to find uh, good deals. So you want to find places that are basically, as they say, kind of a key term. You know, basically all you have to do is turn the key and everything's kind of ready. And so you can find, you know, a restaurant that already has, you know, a kitchen in it that already has kind of the spaces in which you would have the uh, customers, you would have the workers compared to if you're starting from scratch and you have to put it in your own kitchen, you have to kind of reorganize the space uh, for the customers, for the workers, then that's going to be a lot more money, a lot more debt you're going to be 
uh, getting compared to if you can find a spot that's basically ready for you uh, to move in. And so that's what we look at in terms of dealing with debt. You want to find good deals, especially find place that's kind of moving ready for you. Uh, you want to, when it comes to food costs and labor costs, you want to keep things you know low as possible. And with labor costs, you know, sometimes if somebody is asking for a raise and you can't give them that raise, you have to be ready for them to leave you. And they maybe hire a new cook, uh, a new chef uh, for lower amounts of money. Um, so basically, you want to keep the labor cost, you know, as low as possible. And that's one way for you to kind of save money. And the more money you save, the more money you can be making as well. Uh, food cost, you know, talks a lot about uh, reusing, uh, reducing. And it's not, you know, reusing uh, food that you know customers give you back you know when they finish but kind of reusing things that are kind of left over whether it be uh, making you know, soups or making uh, you know different roasts or something like that just try not to waste uh, any food that you have and uh, put it all to you know good smart use in terms of reusing the food that may be left over back in the kitchen and again you'll be kind of saving money uh, navigating those financial issues when you're kind of using everything that you're already paying for and also reducing so you want to not only kind of reuse things but you know reduce the waste uh, sometimes he will start to get smaller portions uh, you know sometimes he will basically you know cut some certain menu items that are too costly for you and that's kind of reduction strategy there so overall again you know the big idea is you know, you face these money issues when you're running a social organization, when you're running a restaurant specifically in our book. And they can be external kind of things outside of the restaurants, trying to get the customers inside, uh, trying to deal with economic factors of the economy and dealing with the media. And you kind of navigate these issues by having these strategies to build a customer base, to receive good press and try to you know, not get any uh, negative press. And then inside the restaurant, you have other financial issues you deal with, uh, the pricing, the debt, the cost of food and labor. And again, you have these different strategies that you try to successfully kind of go around these obstacles, uh, successfully deal with these limitations that you encounter. And the better you are at this, uh, the better you're gonna be in sustaining your overall business. And so now we'll turn to the second type of uh, limitation, the aesthetic limitation. So again, this is more about kind of different uh, standards of taste, and it's more about kind of the restaurant status as a whole. So I'll start with the restaurant status. So basically, you know, all restaurants have a certain status attached to it, and that status basically kind of informs in the uh, customer, you know, what they expect, you know, when they go to a certain place. And here, the cooks and the chefs, you have to kind of navigate, you know, these expectations. And, you know, so do the workers as well. So if you're going to kind of a high-end place, uh, then the chefs have more kind of creativity to kind of do what they want to do. Uh, the, you know, the ability to maybe make certain things that you wouldn't see in, in an Olive Garden or, you know, TGI Fridays or Applebee's or something like that. So when you get to kind of a status of those types of places, more kind of a middle uh, level status, you start to see more constraints put on the cooks and the chefs. You know, I love to make this kind of fancy looking dish, but the customers at the Olive Garden uh, are not expecting to see something you know, like that. So you won't be doing that. So, you know, that's what we're looking at in terms of restaurant status. You know, we expect, you know, certain types of clothing being worn by the, uh, servers we expect certain types of food in terms of the portion sizes the appearance of the food itself and the status can either give you kind of more leeway or it can constrain you and so here basically you know if you want to be very creative and make all these fancy dishes you probably shouldn't go work at the olive garden or the applebee's but on the other hand if you're more kind of interested in serving a lot of quantity over quality then you probably shouldn't go into the high-end places where the portions are going to be much smaller although you know the quality of the food likely will be better and so that's what you're dealing with there you know you have to kind of give the customers what they're expecting to receive and and again that's how you kind of create the uh, loyalty 
the e create the kind of returning customer. You know, I went here expecting something and that's what I got compared to I went here expecting A, but I got B. And, you know, if I wanted to get B, I would have gone somewhere else. So going back to issues of the customer taste specifically, here is, you know, sometimes you have to undercook things. Um, so here, you know, sometimes people, you know, if you, if you overcook it, then you can't really do anything about it. You know, so customers, you know, if they're unhappy with something that's overcooked, then you basically have to start from new and kind of get rid of what you made. So to kind of be smart when dealing with customer taste, they'll undercook things and uh, the customer can always send it back if they want to cook further and they under season things. So again, if you over season it, there's not much you can really do. So you under season it. If they want more season, then you'd be happy to do that for them. Uh, sometimes you have to serve uh, bad food. And by bad food, like not saying the food itself is bad and it's gonna make you sick, but something and perhaps the cooks or the chef uh, wouldn't eat themselves. So the book talks about how, you know, I would never, you know, eat this dish personally. I don't like this type of food, but it's what the customers want. So I'll give them, you know, what they want. I'll cook and I'll serve people food that I wouldn't cook uh, for myself I will, or I wouldn't serve for my family. So again, you kind of have to navigate the taste. He may have one type of taste, but your restaurant's uh, clientele may have a different type of taste. So sometimes you basically have to give them uh, what they want. If you're not giving them what they want, again, you're not going to be navigating this limitation and that can be uh, bad for your business overall. And so issues of time, <clears throat> issues of time we talked about a little bit at the beginning of the book, but basically, you know, you want to create dishes that have low prep time and low creativity. So maybe if you had all the time in the world, you could create these very um, kind of fancy looking dishes um, you know, like a piece of art as well as a, you know, a food, but often you don't have that time. So you have to kind of lower your creativity and maybe it's not looking to your personal standards of what, how you like your food to look, you know, as a chef, as a cook. But again, you know, you have to kind of get it out there and you have to navigate the issues of time. Uh, so the servers will be happy and get good tips. So the customers will be happy and uh, come back. So overall, again, these are kind of limitations that are kind of outside of the uh, individuals in the restaurant. You know, so the social structures, whether it be the aesthetic limitations, what people kind of expect to get in a restaurant and what they don't expect to get, uh, their taste in terms of what they want to eat, what they don't want to eat, and also issues of time. You have to navigate these issues to be successful, uh, just as you have to navigate those outside issues connected to money and the economy. And when you're good at navigating these issues, you know, dealing with these limitations that all restaurants encounter, and then you can be successful, you can have a sustainable business. But when you are failing at dealing with these different limitations, and then you know, you're gonna be losing money, you're not gonna be uh, getting a customer base, and the business will not be sustainable and long-term. So that's basically kind of wrapping up those last two chapters that we read. And it ties into the last couple parts of the second book report. So for the next class, I'm basically going to use it for a review. So the uh, next class will be a review. And then the 27th will be when the uh, paper is due. So I'll leave that there for now. Uh, for the next class, I'll be talking about the book, but directly in reference to the uh, book report guidelines.